everyone, a very warm welcome to another edition of World Panorama. Here we are getting you your weekly dose of major international news with a perspective. I'm Sana Khan. Before we get you detailed reports, here's a look at the top stories this week. China-Japan island dispute heats up. Will radar rattling between Asia's powerhouses turn to conflict? World Panorama takes a look. Iran's supreme leader dismisses U.S. offer of one-to-one -one talks on Tehran's nuclear program, even as U.S. increases pressure of economic war on Tehran. U.S. Justice Department files lawsuit against Standard & Poor for fraudulent ratings during the subprime crisis, claims $5 billion in damages. And massive soccer match-fixing probe by Europol uncovers hundreds of suspicious games, including World Cup qualifiers. Detailed report coming up later. This week, the focus is on the continuing tensions between Japan and China over disputed islands in the South China Sea. Beijing accused Tokyo on Thursday of mounting a smear campaign after Japan said a Chinese frigate had locked its weapons targeting radar on a Japanese warship in a threat of force. Now, over the past several months, Tokyo and Beijing have played a game of chicken in the streets, on the seas, in the air and through the airwaves over a cluster of three uninhabited islands and two big rocks called the Senkaku by the Japanese and the Diayu Islands by the Chinese. Now, Japan seized them back in January 1895 during its first modern war with China, a war that Japan won. Tensions began escalating last year and have grown from anti-Japanese protests in Chinese cities to a war of words to the present situation in which an increasing number of Chinese and Japanese ships and planes are frequenting a very small area in the East China Sea. Now, we will be, take, uh, we will be talking more about these developments, what lies ahead in the days to come. This week on the show, I welcome Rukmini Gupta, Associate Fellow at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. Welcome to the show, Rukmini. Thank you for having before me. Before I get Rukmini's take on our top story, let's have a look at this detailed report. <music> Beijing accused Tokyo on Thursday of mounting a smear campaign after Japan said a Chinese frigate had locked its weapons targeting radar on a Japanese warship in a threat of force. <laughs> According to what I know, the relevant Chinese departments are currently conducting an earnest, solemn investigation into these reports to verify them. The world's second and third largest economies are at loggerheads over uninhabited Japanese-controlled islands in the East China Sea, known as Senkaku in Tokyo and Diao by Beijing, which claims them. The radar incident, which Japan said happened last week, marked the first time the two nations' navies have locked horns in a dispute that has some commentators warning about a possible armed conflict. The problem at present is not China showing strength, but Japan continuously sending its ships and aircraft into waters and airspace around the Daewoo Islands to carry out illegal activities, damaging and infringing China's territorial sovereignty. Recently, Japan has been intentionally stirring up a crisis and causing tensions, blackening China's image. This is diametrically the opposite of the efforts to improve relations. Fire control radar is used to pinpoint the location of a target for missiles or shells. Directing the radar at a target can be considered a step away from actual firing. The radar incident with Japan set to place in the East China Sea on 30th January came days after Chinese Communist Party chief Xi Jinping told an envoy of Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe that he was committed to developing bilateral ties. At a time when it seemed there are signs of improvement towards increasing talks between Japan and China, having this sort of one-sided provocative action taken by the Chinese is extremely regrettable. The long-running row over the islands has escalated in recent months to the point where both sides have scrambled fighter jets while patrol ships shadow each other. All right, uh, let's turn to our uh, guest this week. So, Rukmini, 
you've seen the latest developments that have taken yeah. place. Now, the question is, how serious is the current situation? Is there a real threat of a militarized conflict at this point in time? That's what everyone seems to be talking about. I think there are two important reasons why you, you cannot foresee an immediate conflict over the Tiaoyus and Kaku Islands. Okay. The first is, even though the Japanese have said that the Chinese uh, targeted a fire control radar, a weapons essentially radar at Japanese helicopter earlier on and then a Japanese Navy vessel, the Chinese have denied this. Right. So the fact that the Chinese have denied doing this, which mm. can be seen as an escalation, means that they're not saying, yes, we did it and we will do it again. Okay. So clearly they're saying that we did not do this. Mm. We do not want this escalation. Now, the second reason for why conflict over the Tiaoyu Islands, the Senkakus, mm. may remain limited is because of the very real involvement of the United States. Right. So the United States has acknowledged that mm. it sees the islands under Okinawa administration. Although this is not tantamount to recognizing Japanese sovereignty, hmm. what this means is that under the mutual defense treaty between Japan and the United States, right. any sort of conflict that will involve Okinawa, which hmm. includes the East, East China Sea, hmm. the Senkaku Tiaoyu Islands, will involve Japan as well. Right. So those are the two reasons you're saying that will not actually lead to something disastrous in this near future. But then again, looking back at how China successfully took over, uh, you know, the Scarborough Shoal in the South China Sea from the Philippines, that something like that really cannot happen with Japan because when you compare the military might of these two nations, right. it's, Japan is not, uh, you know, so easy, so to say. So how is China going to approach from here on because they've also been very aggressive about the whole issue as far as these islands are concerned. So you're absolutely right when you say the J Japan Navy is not the same as the Philippine Navy. Hmm. Clearly, Japan has a very well-developed maritime force. And because the United States has a stake in this issue, hmm. clearly escalation will not go the way that it went over the Scarborough Shores hmm. between Philippines and China. Now, China has been extremely vocal on its claims over the islands, and there are many reasons for this. First of all is the territorial, the historical territorial mm. dispute between Japan and China. Right. So this is not a current development. In mm. the Japanese uh, mind, they say that there is no dispute, but China mm. sees this as part and parcel of Japanese mm. colonization of China. So it is a very sort of emotional issue that the Chinese cannot move beyond. Secondly, because of the leadership transition which happened in November and right before that in September was the mm. nationalization of three islands. Right. I think within China there is nationalism that demands Chinese leadership to at least seem to take an extremely strong stance. So we have this back and forth between Japan and China where China is saying that we have undisputed territorial sovereignty over these islands. Right. But at the same time, there are signals that say we are willing to negotiate, the dialogue must remain open, that the bilateral relationship between China and Japan is extremely important. Mm. So at least for the domestic audience, the Chinese leadership cannot say that you know these islands belong to Japan and there mm. is no stance that China will take. Right. They need to placate a domestic audience. Mm. And for that reason, they will continue to uh, sort of seemingly escalate this issue. But in the Chinese mind, this is not escalation. They're stating a position that they have held for a very long time. Uh, the other issue to remember mm. is that in the Japanese um, nationalization of islands, which a lot of people have said was essentially to prevent Governor Ishihara of Tokyo to sort of buy up these islands and escalate this issue within Japan. Right. The Chinese have seen this as changing the status quo. Mm. So in their minds, they are absolutely justified in bringing up the issue mm. of the Senkaku, the Tiayu Islands, and asserting Chinese claims over this. Right. So that really justifies for China the kind of aggressive approach that they seem to be taking. Sometimes in Japan, you know, talking about Japan, they seem to be using more uh, warplanes and naval ships very recently in the Tiayu Island area. So, and they are also, in fact, trying to involve to the, to the best of their abilities, the United States of America into this. Now, but the U.S. also has a position. It also has a stand that it can take. So how do you see things developing as far as America is concerned? Because obviously, America does not want war. It does not want to have a war in which it said that it is going to back uh, Japan because China has its own importance in the area and U.S. has been, uh, you know, trying to tap on that as well. 
Well, it is clear that the Japanese have pushed for a clear statement from the United States. Mm -hmm. But as far back as in 2010, um, Secretary Clinton had already said that this issue is covered under the Japan-US Mutual Defense Treaty. Mm -hmm. And this was reiterated in 2012 by Kurt Campbell. So we see that although the United States has taken no position on sovereignty issues, which is the status stance of the United States, whether it's on South China Sea or on East China Sea, mm. it has clearly uh, agreed that Okinawa and Senkaku come under the mutual defense treaty between U.S. and Japan. What this essentially means is that the U.S. would have to get involved if there was a conflict on right. these islands. Mm. And this is signaling for China, mm. for both the sides, not to escalate the situation. Clearly, neither of the two sides, be it China, be it Japan, along with the United States, want this to escalate into a conflict situation. It is not in Chinese interest at all, because China, which is looking for economic development uh, till at least 2012, 2020, right. by which time it will be a middle uh, mm. income country according mm. to its leadership it needs investment from japan all right uh, rukmini so essentially the best that can be hoped for for the moment is that uh, you know both these sides uh, try and keep this issue at lowest uh, levels of tensions and find areas in which they can mutually be you know beneficial to each other mutually cooperate in several other areas it was wonderful having you on the show this week thanks so much for joining me and sharing your thoughts rukmini thank you very much for having, having the me. idsa with that we're taking a short break after that a look at the protest that rocked bangladesh this week over the war crimes verdict stay tuned Thanks for staying with us. Iran's supreme leader on Thursday strongly rejected proposals for direct talks with the United States, effectively quashing suggestions for a breakthrough one-on-one -on -one dialogue on the nuclear standoff and potentially other issues. The statement posted on Ayatollah Ali Khamenei's website echoes previous remarks opposing bilateral talks with Washington in parallel with stop-and-start nuclear negotiations with world powers, including the U.S., which are scheduled to resume talks later this month. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei dismissed a U.S. offer of one-to-one -one talks on Tehran's nuclear program. In a speech posted online, he said that the U.S. was proposing talks while pointing a gun at Iran. The latest comments marked Khamenei's first reaction since the idea of direct talks it received a high-profile boost earlier this week from U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. Khamenei's remarks came a day after the U.S. tightened sanctions on Iran to further choke off its oil income. The two foes are locked in a tense showdown over an array of issues, including Tehran's nuclear ambitions, which the West and Israel suspect are aimed at military objectives, despite Iran's repeated denials. In relation to the quote from Joe Biden, as our foreign minister correctly said in Munich, our attitude to this proposal is positive. But I ask you Russians, how much do you believe Americans and American words? Are they saying the right thing? Tehran and six world powers are preparing to resume stalled talks over Iran's nuclear program in the Kazakh city of Almaty on February 26. Iran and the P5 plus 1 group of United States, China, Russia, Britain, France and Germany held three rounds of talks last year, the last of which ended in stalemate in June in Moscow. Also this week, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad arrived in Cairo for the first trip by an Iranian head of state to Egypt since the 1979 revolution, underlining the more open ties that have developed since Egyptians elected an Islamist head of state. The United States Department of Justice has filed a lawsuit against America's biggest rating agency, Standard & Poor's, and claimed $5 billion in damages. The reason given was S&P's alleged failure to lower the ratings of subprime mortgages in 2006, and even when it knew that, defaults were gathering steam. Here are the details. A report quoting the U.S. Justice Department alleges that S&P's fraudulent ratings contributed to the failure of a California credit union that required a multi-billion dollar government bailout. It said Western Federal Corporate Credit Union bought the investments because of S&P's endorsement. Western Federal was among five wholesale credit unions that regulators took over in 2009 and 2010. 
S&P misled investors, including many federally insured financial institutions, causing them to lose billions of dollars. In the U.S. lawsuit, the main accusation is that S&P did not opt for mass downgrades of subprime securities till mid-2007, even though it was clear a year earlier that many loans were being defaulted on and borrowers were struggling to repay home loans. If convicted, the credit rating agency may receive a sizable fine as the Attorney General can seek civil penalties up to the amount of the losses suffered as a result of the alleged violations. In this case, it means 5 billion U.S. dollars. I think uh, rating agencies in general have to revisit their own internal policies and make it clear to investors what it is exactly they are doing and what it is they're not doing so investors can make an informed decision. The federal investigation codenamed Alchemy was initiated in November 2009 in connection with the U.S. President's Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force. The task force enhanced coordination and cooperation among federal, state and local authorities. And clashes between Jamaat e Islami activists and the police continued unabated on Wednesday as violence in Bangladesh claimed four lives after a top leader of the fundamentalist party who was given a life term for crimes against humanity, this during the 1971 Liberation War. Here's a closer look. Thousands of protesters took to the streets in Dhaka city of Bangladesh for the second day on February 6th to demand the execution of Abdul Qadir Mullah after he was sentenced to life in prison for war crimes committed during the 1971 independence conflict. Mullah's sentencing by a war crimes tribunal for charges including murder, rape and torture was a second verdict in trials that have reopened the wounds of Bangladesh's struggle to break away from Pakistan. The popular unrest on the streets was compounded by a national strike organized by Mullah's Jamaat Islami party. About 50 people were injured and about 100 arrested in clashes between Jamaat activists and police. We have gathered here to press our demand for the execution of Abdul Qadir Mullah because we want proper justice and the decision taken is incorrect. We are suffering since 1971 and after so many years a proper decision has not been taken. This is a kind of promotion and nothing else. So we demand justice. We are here to protest for Abdul Qadir Mullah's hanging and I think this gathering showcases the unity of the people of Bangladesh against crime and I am with them. The war crimes court handed down its first judgment last month, sentencing a former Jamaat leader and popular Islamic preacher Abdul Kalam Azad for similar crimes. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina set up the tribunal in 2010 to investigate abuses during the 1971 conflict. But critics say she is using it as a political weapon against the two biggest opposition parties, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party and Jamaat e Islami. Bureau Report, Raja Sabha TV. Another short breather. After that, this week's most explosive news item from football as Europol uncovers match fixing ring. Don't go anywhere. You're watching World Panorama. Time now to take a quick look at some of the other international news events and a quick wrap. Here's Globe Watch. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry was sworn in publicly on February 6 at a ceremony at the U.S. State Department event attended by Kerry's family, his Senate staff and political dignitaries including former secretaries of the state. Vice President Joe Biden administered the oath of office to Kerry. At the ceremony, Kerry vowed to stand up to extremism, terrorism, chaos and evil. Kerry succeeds former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton as the top U.S. diplomat. South Korea's Defense Ministry said on Thursday, North Korea would possibly detonate a boosted fission weapon. International tension is high over a possible nuclear test thought to be imminent after a rocket launch. North Korea has threatened to attack rival South Korea if Seoul joined a new round of tightened UN sanctions as Washington unveiled more of its own economic restrictions following Pyongyang's rocket launch in December. 
Afghan President Hamid Karzai joined cooperative talks at Chequers with Pakistani President Asif Ali Zardari and British Prime Minister David Cameron. In an interview prior to the meeting, Afghan President Hamid Karzai expressed concerns about possible external difficulties after international forces end their mission in Afghanistan. Cameron's meeting with the two leaders, Hamid Karzai and Asif Ali Zardari, was aimed at discussing peace talks and ways to secure closer ties with Afghanistan and Pakistan. The meeting also intended to focus on how to tackle security threats after international troops leave Afghanistan in 2014. A powerful 8.0 magnitude earthquake set off a tsunami that killed at least nine people in a remote part of Solomon Islands on Wednesday and triggered evacuations across South Pacific as island nations issued tsunami alerts. Photographs taken by World Vision after the tsunami hit showed the location of homes and buildings in Leita province that were swept away by a series of tidal surges. And Europol has revealed that 680 football matches across the globe are under suspicion of match fixing following a lengthy investigation into what it considers a criminal network within the sport. The results of the ongoing international investigation into the fixing of football matches reveal a far reaching system that has affected hundreds of games. They also show that efforts by UEFA and FIFA to combat match fixing have been a failure, as have attempts to arrest the scandal's primary suspect. One big statement from Europol, the European Union's police agency and the world football was left stunned, dropped by a massive match-fixing scandal. Uh, we have known uh, for some time that organized crime operates in many parts of the illegal economy and that it affects society and its citizens in very many different ways. This is the first time that we've established substantial evidence that organized crime is not also now operating in the world of football. Investigators from across Europe said on Monday that they had identified a total of some 660 suspicious matches from around the world, bringing in at least 8 million euros in proven profits. We have uncovered an extensive criminal network involved in widespread football match fixing. A total of 425 match officials, club officials, players and serious criminals from more than 15 countries are suspected of being involved in attempts to fix more than 380 professional football matches. Brazil manager Luis Felipe Scolari had called on soccer authorities to clamp down hard on match fixing in the wake of allegations. No, no, no. I don't think it will affect Brazilian football, but international football must observe what is happening and finish all of that. What we want more is that football is transparent, that everybody believes in football. The investigations will probably continue. I believe Brazilian football will not be affected by all this. At least those are in my feelings. We hope that everything is investigated and that people are punished. I have never experienced it uh, close, uh, close, and uh, I we never, I never heard about it. So you know, just get sad. In fact, Singapore's squeaky clean image is on the line after an inquiry by Europol found hundreds of soccer matches were fixed in the global betting scam run from Ireland State. Other matches fixed included World Cup qualifications, UEFA Champions League matches of which one played in Britain and top flight league matches in several European countries. And time now for all the very latest news from the world of movies and lifestyle. Here's our entertainment wrap. Bruce Willis is now back as John McClane in his fifth Die Hard movie, A Good Day to Die Hard, which premiered in Berlin on 4th February. Director John Moore, actors Jay Courtney and Willis brought a bit of Hollywood glitz to the grey skies over Berlin when they walked the red carpet. A Good Day to Die Hard is currently set for a global rollout in cinemas in mid-February 2013. 
US pop singer Beyonce delivered an impressive performance during the halftime show for Super Bowl on 3rd February. The superstar performed remix renditions of several of her greatest hits including Single Ladies and Halo. Beyonce was also joined on stage by Michelle Williams and Kelly Rowland of the former group Destiny's Child. The trio sang several songs together before leaving Beyonce to deliver the final songs in a solo performance. Fashion designer Jean-Paul Gaultier travelled from Paris to a new retrospective of his work in Rotterdam on Wednesday on a train he had dressed up in his own personal colours. Disregarding the usual fashionable concern to avoid clashing outfits, both Gaultier and Thales' train were clad in his signature white and blue sailor stripes. Well, that's all we have for you in this edition of World Panorama. I'll be back next week, same time, with more world news. Till then, you can join us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. This week, we wrap up with some exhilarating visuals from the 9th Aero India show, one of the biggest in Asia. The event, held in Bangalore every year, showcases India's advances in the aviation industry. Goodbye, and thanks for watching.